Is climate change having an impact on, on how these insects are moving? Is, is the warmer weather allowing them to move faster? Yeah, well, interesting, yeah. There's a lot of things associated with, a, with an increasing climate, uh, not the least of which is the vegetation itself has a longer period to grow in and then maybe a, more, a bigger surprise. If they're responding to photo period, you know, they're, not wa they're waiting until March to, because the photo period hasn't changed, but the temperature has changed dramatically. So mm -hmm. those organisms that can take advantage of the warming temperature without responding to photo period get, a, get an advantage, a little bit of an advantage. So a lot of complicated things. Also insects, like we have the southern pine beetle down on Long Island, which is a very good example of that, was never there. We never thought it would be there. We thought that it was climatically excluded because it has no capacity in all of our studies of its biology. It has no capacity to be frozen in the winter. A lot of other insects, they can hibernate. Mm -hmm. They can do things internally that protect them from the frost or the ice. Southern pine beetle doesn't use that strategy. So now it's killing all the pine barrens down there on, on Long Island. And uh, it, the bottom line for me is the climate has changed to be able to support those beetle populations. They've probably always and continuously been trying to, uh, as food, right? They've been trying to feed on it, but up until four years ago, they were not really able to get it. And the changes we're seeing up north, is that enabling any of these forest pests to either spread yeah. more, spread quicker, or uh, increase the likelihood that they're it's going to arrive here? It's hard for us to quantify that, but you know, we have these alpine tundra areas in the Adirondacks yeah. that are the only place in the continental U.S. where we have those, or uh, at least on the uh, east side of the Mississippi, where we have those, and, uh, and uh, those are tiny fragments of, of, a, of an ecosystem, and, and we have balsam fir that is the major component of that habitat. We have a Bicknell's thrush, yeah. which is absolutely critically dependent on the balsam fir. And now we have the balsam woolly adelgid, which is an exotic introduced insect that's assisting the death of the, of the balsam. How much it's doing it, and all those complicated issues that are associated with the changing climate, we don't really know, but we're certainly watching it. And we'd like to watch it with more detail than we currently are. It's like a different variety of the, of the uh, yeah, it's it, if you um, if you go out and see it on the balsam trees, um, it causes more, we call it gouting. You know how the woolly adelgid gets on the, the distal twiglets of the hemlock trees. Yeah. Well, it does the same thing on the balsam trees, except that its feeding causes it to swell and gout. Yeah. So you have this gnarly gouting around on those distal, especially at the top. But also when the populations get big, the balsam woolly adelgid attacks the bowl of the tree, the main stem. You almost never see that with the hemlock woolly adelgid. So you see these little tiny white fluffs on the, and if you're in the Indian Lake area, those and can identify a balsam tree because a lot of people prefer them as Christmas trees mm -hmm. so they have that peculiar balsam smell. Right. Um, you can see those, actively see them right there on those trees right, right outside of Indian Lake.